Listen in the reset race. You now tuned in the reset race. Uh, uh. You're listening to Reset Race. You're now tuned in the Reset Race. What? Put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Back on the grill again. We grilling them. Uh. You're listening to Reset Race. Adults need reparations to make America great. Uh. You're tuned in the Reset Race. We no longer starving while others eat off our plate. No. You're listening to Reset Race, we focused on our justice claim, we know what is at stake, uh, you tuned in to Reset Race, you'll find out who really done justice and really who fake, on the edge, go back to U.S. Southern plantations, Pennies, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration, redlining and lynchings, we are old from this nation, you're not about justice if you ain't for reparations, IMG the wise one, cousin mother intellectual, Samantha bringing fire, anti-black, we pressing you, no permanent friends and no permanent enemies. Enemies, the backbone of the country, the way you need our energy. You gonna see? Listen in the reset race. You now tuned in the reset race. Uh, uh. You're listening to Reset Race, you're now tuned in the Reset Race, uh, put them back on the grill again, we grilling them, put them back on the grill again, we grilling them, put them back on the grill again, we grilling them, back on the grill again, we grilling them, uh, you're listening to Reset Race, Adels need reparations to make America great, uh, you're tuned in the Reset Race, we no longer starving while others eat off our plate, no, you're listening to Reset Race, we focused on our justice claim, we know what is at stake, uh, you're tuned in the Reset Race, you'll find out who really about justice and really who fake, uh. Welcome to Reset Race, where we talk about race and politics and how those two things intersect to affect the black people in the United States of America, specifically those of us who descend from, from chattel slavery. Um, and we talk a lot about reparations and policy and practice and all kinds of crazy shit. Thanks for, thanks for stopping by. Um, quickly, we're going to introduce the crew, and then we'll get into the video. All right, first up is Sam. Sam, introduce yourself. So you can call me the Khaleesi as adorned by my brother, John. As always, I'm happy to be here with the family and uh, talk a little trash and uh, give a little information. And uh, I'm just looking forward to having fun. That's pretty much what it is about for me every day. You can always get at me on Twitter at me 17 trillion. That's pretty much the only thing that I'm on. The rest of social media, for the most part, I find boring. And even Twitter, I find most of you guys boring on there. But from time to time, if you want some smoke, now if you come with that smoke, we can have some fun. I'm here for it. So, Yeah, what's up, everybody? This is John C. Uh, I don't really be on Twitter like that, but if you want some smoke, like Sam said, you can follow me at John Daniel C. Back with the fam. And we're about to get into it. We're about to have these conversations and do what we always do, which is grill motherfuckers. Yeah, they call me Mud. You can find me on social media, all at of lineage. That's one word, O F L I N E A G E, at of lineage. Um, Better Dose TV, all on Actify Press. Let's get it. Today's video. What, what's the video we're going? We're going to do, Sam. So, Damn, are we allies? Black Americans versus Asian Americans, middle ground. So, are we uh. allies? No. End of show. Grand opening, grand closing. Yay! <laughs> Hooray! Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> cute, 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 Wayne. All right. So, and, and understand what I mean when I say we are not allies. That does not automatically make us enemies. But there mm -hmm. are no inherent allies. Just because Absolutely. you are non-white does not automatically make you an ally. So that's what I'd like to say. And I guess I should start off this conversation by saying what have Asian Americans done to allow ally themselves with black Americans outside of the Japanese Americans, because Japanese Americans who were interned have actually stood up and backed reparations for black Americans. My name is Susan Hayase. I'm a Sante. I'm a third generation Japanese American, and I'm a co-founder of the San Jose Nikkei Resistors, which planned this panel discussion. Um, I'm a longtime activist in the San Jose Japanese American community. And I worked with the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations during the 80s and early 90s to fight for redress for former World War II incarcerees. 
Um, I was honored to have been appointed to the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund by President Clinton, and I served as the vice chair from 1995 to the bill's sunset in 1998. So San Jose Nikkei Resistors uh, started doing community uh, discussions last year, and what came out of it was a joint statement uh, by Japanese American community organizations in the San Jose area endorsing HR 40 and calling on Japanese Americans um, everywhere to, to endorse it also. And we're um, launching a campaign to get Japanese American community, cultural and other organizations to endorse our, our statement endorsing HR 40. So Japanese mm -hmm. people, you're excluded from this conversation. Thank you. Everybody else. And Everybody else. Let's well, let's let, let we got it. Well, since we're keying on people, we have to key on. Uh, uh, we have to key on people who have shown themselves to be allies, and folks that have shown themselves not to be allies. So, just turned. We just saw that the uh, the Chinese have been funding the the Proud Boys. So, yes, uh, <laughs> Chinese Americans are funding the Proud Boys. Who knew? Am I shocked? And no, the of course one not. People crying about anti black about black people beating the brakes off of them. They're the ones. The Chinese are the ones that are pushing this um, black people as the. Uh, as the assaulters of Asians. They're the ones pushing yeah. that narrative. So putting two and two mm. together makes sense. Yeah, that's Sorry, true. this is just because I was in this dumb room in Clubhouse and ugh, this is why I don't do Clubhouse. The reason why I don't do Clubhouse is listening to people of color talk on Clubhouse makes me hate people of color. Y'all are terrible. You. And I'm not saying every single person. I'm saying that Clubhouse has a small microcosm, a small, a small sampling of racial groups, and they mm -hmm. say su such obnoxious, racist things that if you, as a person, does not sit down and say, "Wait, this is a small sample size of the larger group," not all of them think this way. Because if not, you would have an issue. Yeah, I can't with y'all. Sorry, but go also, ahead. Also, we, 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 we also have to remember that this is, is number one, is not just, when we say POC, we're talking we're talking about folks that are not, we're talking about black folks too, that oh, are yeah, non, 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 non slave is, descendants. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Because they, they're, many of them are just as bad. And we're, what? we've come to find out over the last few years that they've been holding up, they've been harboring some, a lot of ill will towards us that, towards yes. us that they, that they had been keeping to themselves mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. All right. So, <laughs> so with that said, this is a video from Jubilee uh, from January of, of this year, of January of 2021. So, all right, Sam, let's ride and see what they, what the people are talking about. It's a meh. We it's a meh. You're we're gonna have to really we're gonna have to unpack this way more than they do because the black mm -hmm. people all here are soft. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know how we do. <laughs> they're, they're soft. I, 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 I will work on this, MG. I'm really working on being a lady. <laughs> 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 you're all right with us just the way you are so whatever you want to do we we will back you 100 percent sis <laughs> should we use the word delicate for them then delicate is good i like i like delicate delicate is a much better word than soft <laughs> Thank you. that's fair because it was uh, definitely very kid gloves mm. very kid gloves and get caught up, but they get caught up in the fancy language and all this other bullshit. You gonna see. You see my skin as dirty, and you also see my culture as dirty. And then people come over here, and you start pressing me in my country that I help build, my family help build. I think a misconception that Asian Americans have about Black Americans is that we are violent, rude, lazy, that we don't like or respect them. George Huang woke this morning to find his mini mall burned to the ground. They just don't seem to have any respect for the black community. If anything, I'm not sure if there's enough knowledge about the Asian American culture to have a misconception, if that makes sense. One of the biggest things I wanted to address is how much anti-blackness is rooted in our culture. Sometimes it's very subtle but is very deeply rooted. Latasha Harlins, a black teenager, is shot and killed by a Korean store owner. I think they have a lot of the quote unquote good stereotypes and I feel like a lot of black people deal with a lot of bad quote unquote stereotypes. Their oppression, you know, is horrible, but Asian oppression is also horrible. 
you know, Asian people just want to hang out with Asian people only, like trying to talk with them or whatever. Sometimes they would just look at me and just like ignore me. My name is Lynn, I'm 30 years old, I'm an actor, and I'm also unemployed. <laughs> My name is Faith, I'm 21, and I'm currently an apprentice for a hair salon. Hi, I'm Tony, I'm 35, a digital marketer and a podcaster. Hi, my name is Regina, I'm 29, I currently work as a data engineer. Hi, my name is Taylor, I'm 25, and I currently work as a program assistant for a nonprofit. What's up, y'all? My name is Joseph, I am 27, and I'm an actor, musician, activist, and looking for work. <laughs> <laughs> if you agree with the statement, I want you to step forward and take a seat. I care about being accepted by white America. Being accepted in white culture um, means, I, I guess, I'm not like discriminated in, in a heavy way. And I think there is a level of comfort that I take in that. Um, not that that doesn't mean I'm like going against like any other culture, but it. Pause. Proceed, sir. Very quickly. This is the core of the problem. America has always makes it difficult white America specifically, always makes it difficult, those in power, always make it difficult for people to ally with us. You are punished if you ally with us. So the, and the, 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 what that boils down to is, if you want to make it here in the United States, part of that is to push black people down. You have to stand on black folks in order to get ahead. The, the Italians did it, the, the, sorry, sorry folks, the Jews did it, the, um, the Greeks did it, the Germans, everybody did it to come into whiteness in the United States of America, right? So, um, and that is one of the, pre, that's one of the prerequisites to, ri to rise in this country is to leave us be behind. I wrote an article, I called it, Leave Them Negroes Outside, because that is the cost of being part of the mainstream in the United States is leaving us outside. That is the single, let me say this again, that is the single co cost that goes across every single culture. No matter who you are, whether you're African, whether you're Caribbean, whether you're who, it doesn't matter who it is, you have to leave black folks behind, black Americans who descend from shadow slavery behind. That's the cost of getting into whiteness. That's why they're willing to throw us under the bus. Uh, anybody want, got anything on that? Isn't it interesting how he's saying this, but he's like dressed like Kanye or Pharrell. He looks Korean to me. And you know, Koreans and Blacks, we, we our cultures run close together in this country because a lot of Koreans and Blacks live, uh, a lot of Koreans live near Black people. So that mm. I have seen a lot of Korean people adopt black culture. Yeah, I mean a lot. I mean anybody who gets anywhere near sure us ends up a. Sorry, mm, go ahead. Yeah, I mean anybody gets anywhere near us ends up adopting our culture in some way, shape, or form, um, whether it's through sports, whether it's through art, music, whatever. Uh, uh, and this and this guy, it's no shock <laughs> because our culture is American culture. You know what I mean? So this is this is his way of, I guess, fitting in, but. Ultimately, what's going to uh, fitting in is one thing, but if you're going to move forward in this country, leaving us behind is the key. John, what you got? I'm sorry, Mud, were you finished? Yeah, that's all I wanted to add to that. All right, but John, what you got? Well, I mean, yeah, I agree with everything I, I was saying on this, man. Like, he do like he the third member of the Neptunes and shit. <laughs> he, <laughs> <wanna be>, <laughs> <laughs> he the third. <laughs> he skateboard people. Yeah. Other nigga that do, on the drum machine and something like that. Not, not the dude that's with him. Some other dude in the background, but he won't be accepted mm -hmm. by white people. I mean, yeah, this you know this is this is not a shock to us. You already know. You already know this. Shit. Yeah, yeah, we know. You we know? understand. Yep. So, yep. So. All right, let's ride, Sam. It, there is a comfort level, and I think it's a privilege that I have that I'm able to be looked that way, even though I'm a minority. Yeah, I think um, it's a sad reality that I have to sit here, literally only because I think 
currently white America runs our society mm -hmm. and our system. Right. And in order for me to benefit myself, my family, I need to align with that sometimes. It actually gives me great anxiety when I step into a situation and I know I'm the only POC because then suddenly I am in my head as to how should I act to have a normal conversation. A lot of the times when I'm in a group setting when everybody's Asian, especially Asian people who only have Asian friends. 100%, I know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. I get this weird feeling that now you're gonna label me as the white one. <laughs> and I hate that wow. because yeah. I'm not white. Yeah. It's just a really weird identity crisis. It's the first time in my life I've heard someone say exactly what I've been feeling for my entire life. But yeah, that's exactly how I feel about that. Can you I hope that you can release yourself from the shackles of that because you're never going to be, and it, it, I understand, but you're never going to be accepted. That's how they've set this country up. And like, as a black woman, I would like to take this moment to say that's a fucking lie. That Asian woman can marry a white man and move into a white suburb and be accepted. Exactly. And not be looked as differently. That's why she says she has, like, she will align with white people. She knows that there's circumstances where she can align with white people. Like, so, we don't really have those those instances like that. Mm, I agree. Yeah, you'll you'll be slightly different. You know, <laughs> somebody. The worst is going to happen. Your neighbor is going to have an Asian fetish, and that'll be that. <laughs> I want to go two places with this, right? When we did the um, anti-blackness in Asian cultures with the Indian Asians. They mm -hmm. talked about how there was already like uh, a family, an, e an Indian Asian family that was living in the neighborhood and then a black family moved in and nobody wanted their kids to play with the black family. And the Asian Indian family felt pressure not to let their kids play with the black family because they didn't want to be ostracized. So this is things that happen. Mm -hmm. Like they understand that there is like a buffer and everybody understands that black people, it's, it's anti-blackness and it's even more so it's, it's anti-black Americanness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's true. Because the Nigeri the Nigerian family moved in it to be different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then yeah. the next, so the next point I wanted to make was: we as black people have to stop telling people of color what their experiences and is in this country. You are not a person of color. You are a black American. Your experience is different, so you don't get to tell a Asian woman or a white Latina or a normal or a, or a medium colored Latina, mm -hmm. what their experience is and how they'll be seen and how they'll be accepted or if they won't be accepted. Cause I see people of color accepted in white society all the time, yeah. all the time. So you can't, you can't, you can't like take your experience and kind of like use it to be like, Yo, well, you'll never be accepted because you're just like me. Like she's basically trying to be like, you're just, you know, black people, we've been going through this for so long. We've never been accepted. So since we've never been accepted, you won't. That's not yeah, how yeah. this works. That's how the yeah. Irish became white. The Chinese, Japanese mm -hmm. got more money than white people. And uh, that's yeah. how the Latinos are going to become white. A lot of dyed in the wool white supremacists will marry an Asian woman. They will marry an Asian woman quick, mm -hmm. and, and and they'll be accepted in the community. I don't know. If, I don't know what that's about. Maybe it's, maybe they meet in the middle about hating us. I don't. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But that's a lot of dyed in the wool white supremacists will will pick an Asian wife. Big John, you got anything on that? You, no, nah, you're you right, man. You're right. It's crazy how these motherfucking white supremacists they love. They got they really got a weird ass Asian fetish and shit. Like that shit. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I don't know what that's about. You know they weird. Maybe they like, trying to get a POC pass or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they like Pokemon a lot. Maybe they just like, I don't know what the fuck these niggas into. <laughs> Actually, I would like to take this moment to say that white supremacists love all non white pussy. And mm -hmm. damn it, I'm mad that I said it because fuck, I'm trying to be a lady. <laughs> <laughs> but let's not pretend like 
went after the Capitol raid that there wasn't a bunch of pictures of these proud boys with they black wives. A lot of them wasn't black Americans, but there was a few there was a few black American women sprinkled mm-hmm. in there with mm-hmm. these racist white supremacist husbands from the Proud Boys. Shout out mm-hmm. to Strong Thurman. With they <laughs> 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 Shout, yeah, out, shout to out to every light skinned Negro in America. Shout out, <laughs> shout out to Joe Biden for doing Strong Thurman's eulogy. That's a very nice uh, introduction. It could have been shortened a great deal by saying Joe Biden here is here tonight. He works for Strom Thurmond. Uh, <laughs> I came to the United States Senate, a 29-year-old fella, out of the civil rights movement, a public defender, and turns out one of my closest friends ends up being Strom Thurmond, a man whose background and interest at that time when I came were considerably different than mine. If you had told me when I entered the United States Senate that one of the people that I would have the closest relationship with in the Senate would be Strom Thurmond, I would have told you that you were crazy. And so I guess I can, uh, I can kid about Strom because as Strom told me, he said, Joe, uh, if there has to be a Democrat as president, and I hope it won't happen, he said, it might as well be you. And after I dropped out of the race, he came to me and said, don't worry about it. He said, you got a good 30 years left to try. Uh, mm, mm. No, don't get me started on Don't get me started on Joe. Hey, but you got to you throw it out there, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, let, guy. Yeah, that's that's fair. That's fair. But I think one thing we need to one thing we need to view this this white acceptance. I think we need to view it as a spectrum, right? We're always going to be in the red, right? <laughs> We're always going to be in the red. Black Americans will always be in the red for obvious reasons. Um, and then some folks end up in the yellow, and a lot of these Asian folks end up in the green, right? There's a level of acceptance, and I think. Um, like most people in the United States that are, aren't us are willing to accept being yellow or, or, or almost all the way green as long as they're not in the red. You know what I mean? So they're willing to be the yellow and green as long as we're in the red and in the red by ourselves. They don't give a fuck. You so know, and that's very comfortable, very comfortable being the buffer class. Very comfortable being the buffer class and very comfortable with our oppression. Very comfortable to our oppression. As a matter of fact, it's to the point at this point, they don't understand how the world could function without our oppression. This is really weird, but it is what it is. Anybody else got anything on that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, go, ahead, Mike. go ahead, please. Oh, you want to go, Sam? Or I actually want you to go first because you don't talk a lot. So I would like to hear your verse. Yeah, we don't get enough mud. Mine. Yeah. I bet you never go heard ahead. that on Clubhouse. We don't get enough mud. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please, man. <laughs> Nah, I, I think it's 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 a little bit deeper than like just the racial thing because like we were talking about earlier, like even when we're we're talking about black people from African nations or the Caribbean, they get a different experience because it, in American society, it's not just the blackness. It's also like Dr. King said in that clip, um, it's the othering that has been done based off of slavery. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think white people in this country, and I'm talking about non-segregation, as people devoid or thinking they're devoid of racism, do you have any idea of what they want the Negro to be in America? Well, it depends on the level that we are talking here, uh, because I think you have to make a distinction between the people who are genuinely and absolutely committed in the white community on the question of of racial equality. And I must confess that I think they're in a very small minority. I think the vast majority of white Americans uh, will go but so far. It's a kind of installment plan for equality. And uh, they are always looking for an excuse uh, to go but so far. Why are they looking for the excuse? What is it about the Negro? I mean, every other group that came as an immigrant somehow, not easily, but somehow got around it. Is it just the fact that Negroes are black? That's a part of it, and growing, that grows out of something else. You can't thingify anything 
without depersonalizing that something. If you use something as a means to an end, at that moment you make it a thing and you depersonalize it. The fact is that the Negro was a slave in this country for 244 years. That act, uh, that was uh, a willful thing that was done. The Negro was brought here in chains, treated in very inhuman fashion. And this led to the thingification of the Negro. So he was not looked upon as a person. He was not looked upon as a human being with the same uh, status and worth as other human beings. And the other thing is that human beings cannot continue to do wrong without eventually uh, rationalizing that wrong. So slavery was justified morally, biologically, uh, theoretically, scientifically, everything else. And it seems to me that white America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. And that's what, what what's created our culture is kind of like the experience of slavery and this history of discrimination in this country. So when they look at us, they, they don't accept our culture. So we, what, what, what makes us acceptable to them is if we remove, remove ourselves further and further from our culture versus like these other groups, like you can be authentically, you know, Korean and be accepted um, because it's seen as exotic in a way. Um, mm -hmm. But we can't be authentically, you know, um, black American because it like, it's been our culture has been seen as something that is like lower class. It's 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 coded mm -hmm. that way. So like you'll see somebody uh, you'll see a black person with one of these white supremacists, but they're the most whitewashed black person you'll ever meet in your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Candace Owens. Yeah, it's not going to be, you know, a certain type of black person. Mm -hmm. Self-respecting, maybe. Maybe that's the word you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up on that a long time ago because I know I'll never be accepted. I grew up in a conservative white um, area. It was such a big difference where I was like, you know what, I'm going to be the blackest person ever. So, <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it was one of those things of anti, I had to learn how to be more respectful to their culture because I felt like they were trampling on mine so much. I went the opposite, almost militant black. <laughs> yep. Ah, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I think Asian people are cool personally, right? Like I'll try to like hang with them because I, I love learning culture. So I'll try to like go and have conversations or whatever. And sometimes it's just been like this more like standoffish, like this is our group. And, you know, we have our own like little thing going on. And so I feel like for me, I was like, what, what, like what, what's up with that, right? And so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely had that pop into my head because yeah. it's something that you hear. And then when you see it, it's like your brain automatically just pulls up that stereotype, you know? Um, I grew up in a predominantly East Asian neighborhood, Arcadia in San Gabriel Valley. But there's still this group of like old white families there. They would say things and I would back in middle school like I would kind of repeat it not really understanding like oh Asians are bad drivers and be like oh yeah Asians are bad drivers and then I'm like no that's really racist would I feel comfortable about somebody saying something like that about black people like no I wouldn't so I kind of had to like correct myself my parents didn't hang out with anybody else than themselves because mm -hmm. it's that immigrant mentality you kind of stick with each other to bring each other up because you feel as if you're other. You want yeah. to succeed in America. So if you've got a friend who is a mechanic, you need your car fixed, you're gonna oh, go to yeah. that guy because you speak the same language. And so you're around the same kind of people. Mm -hmm. I think that that definition of other is really scary because when you don't know what that other is, you start to make up what you think that might be. And that could be completely wrong. I just thank you for saying other. And I'm glad she said other so many times. I'm just really glad that she said other so many times, if you think about it, because of the fact that that's how they see us. So you can't BIPOC us. They see us as other. How can Everybody. we be together when they see us as other? 
and I don't have an issue with this. I'm just saying like facts are facts. And this is why when this started off and I said, are we allies? I said, no, because there are no inherent allyships. They have to be created. Have Asian Americans tried to build allyships with black Americans? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you listen to what she said uh, about like how white people run the society and how they have to be complicit with white people. They're not I mean, interested. They're, they made their alliance. It's just not with us. Mm -hmm. Ooh, can you say that again? Cause I was being, I was talking over you. Can you please say it again so people can hear you and I'm gonna shut up. Uh, they see it as everybody, they, they're worried about uh, being others. So they other every other group and remain within their own group. But they understand white people run the society, so they're going to uh, be complicit with white people. They're going to work with them. They're going to uh, align with them to benefit themselves. So mm -hmm. they made their alliance. It's just not with us. Yep. Well, yeah. That's it. And that's all, John. You got anything, boo? Yeah, that's that's the truth. Yeah, the Asians they they already picked they already picked their team, man. I mean, I'm not can't speak in general, but I mean, come on, like it's obvious. Like they they picked the team. She's basically saying that you know she's complicit with the way our society runs and the way that it's structured. And and um and I just also find it interesting that like Asians, like the black dude, he really want to be in the Asian space, like. But Asians is they in our spaces, like they do business in our communities all the time, like. And it's like they don't. It's like if um for some reason we have to be black, we always gotta be the one to try to connect with them, like at, like if I move if. If I move to Chinatown and open up a black business and didn't learn about their culture or anything like that, they gonna get me the fuck out of there. But they can come here, they don't talk to us, and I'm like, they don't do they just they just there to get their money. And in order for me to come, I gotta come to them and learn Mandarin and all that in my community, like. So it's just mm. this this shit this shit crazy, man. This shit crazy. So yeah, yeah one of thanks, John. One and one of the important points here that we've got to um we've got to make clear, you know, it's cool that, you know, a few individuals will come and, and and march for Black Lives Matter or for the for the true movement, which is in the streets. Mm -hmm. All right. Not not not, not those the folks. Yeah, not those folks who were put in leadership. Um we're talking about the folks who are in the streets fighting the fighting the good fight. Um, it's cool to have those individuals hanging out with us or, or in the streets with us or, or even, you know, in their in their personal lives, investing in, in our communities or investing in in, in uh, politics and movements that help us. But what are their institutions doing? That's the question. What are their institutions lobbying government for? Right. What are their institutions doing to support us? Because our institutions that are supposed to be supporting us support everybody but us, the NAACP. Huh? I'm sorry. That's why we ain't get nothing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. That's I, right. I You're right. Forgive me. I'm Please sorry. Me. NAACP, they fight for everybody. They fight for, for Latinos and, and other immigrants harder than they do for us. All right. Up next, we have uh, NAACP President Derek Johnson, also a plaintiff in the lawsuit. Please give me a warm welcome for him. You know, for all of you who marched over 230 miles to be here, we stand here representing the oldest and largest civil rights organization in the country. <laughs> Behind me is Brad Berry, our general counsel, and Jeanette Luard, our deputy general counsel, who brought the DACA lawsuit. Because as African Americans, we understand the journey of 230 miles because we have been fighting this fight for over 400 years. It is a journey that we understand clearly that when we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. It is an understanding that an attack on any communities of color is an attack on all communities of color. The NAACP will fight justice wherever it occurs. And in this case, we believe that the government's decision to renege on promises that it made to hundreds of thousands of people who are here as our neighbors, who are working, who are going to school, who are not in trouble with the law, we believe that rescission of the program under those circumstances is just untenable.
right? Um, NAAC, the NAACP, the Urban League, everybody's going, I'm fighting, they're fighting for POC, right? Black, <laughs> they're black fighting August, for the POC yeah, the Black August, August yeah, the, <laughs> the Black August P, a POC caucus, but the but the Hispanic caucus, <laughs> caucus, the Asian caucus, the 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 default white caucus, they're all fighting for their own people. We're okay. the only group that's not expected to fight for our own people. And, MG, can you hold that for a second and not lose your train of thought? Uh, can I can I throw this out here that the reason why the uh, Black Caucus and all NAACP and all of our groups are lobbying for everybody else is because the fundraising dollars are in non-Black issues. If it's attached to Black oh. people, people don't care about donating to it or making it happen in a real way outside of Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter had nothing set up to go into the actual Black community. So you just threw money at a slogan. Mm -hmm. Y'all should yep. just bought t-shirts instead of giving them like real <laughs> donations. Y'all should just buy t-shirts. T-shirts and masks. Yep. That should have been your donation. Yep, you're right. Not like real money. They shouldn't have raised a billion dollars off a slogan, just a slogan that did nothing. Mm -hmm. They're like, but oh, you, but it you, created awareness. What policies got made? Man. You see, but, uh, uh, go ahead, I, please. Go ahead. Add, uh, I just wanted to add this real quick. Um, you see, they know how to like get things done, like serious things done politically for themselves. But when when it's us, they just throw their money at symbolism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. That's a good point, Mud. That's a really good point. You know, so I, I think we have again. We get it, we need to pay attention to institutions, what the institutions are doing again, because um, people often when you ask what um, because the key here is solidarity requires reciprocity, right? Everybody wants to talk about solidarity, but nobody wants to talk about reciprocity. What's in it for me? Because everybody else is thinking what's in it for me, yeah. right? Awesome. Everybody else does it. Whether they do it, ver whether they let you know or not, but everybody else is cut because you can see how things lay out, right? For one year, the uh, the Asian community started under Trump. Remember this now. Trump is gone. Started under Trump. That uh, the 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 uh, the coronavirus and China China virus and all this other shit that to hurt people's feelings. God, craziness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no cop, no cops killed any Asian people. No, no, no mobs of crazy white folks hang hung any hung any Asian people that I know of. Some a couple of beatings here and there. And we we did have one mass killing, but by I don't think that was man. by a white man that I don't think was connected to kung flu. As the as as uh as uh what's his name as uh tr Donald Trump would say, it was, was it connected to any of that rhetoric, right? No, it wasn't. So, so so um let's be clear and they still got paid under the biden administration right so they can lobby on both sides they were lobbying during during the during the trump administration to mm -hmm. get that shit to stop and they lobby to get paid under the democrats yeah. right and you see in every and every time uh and and while trump was in office he signed an asian and an aapi um uh, economic inclusion um empowerment economic empowerment. Econ econ yeah, yeah economic empowerment uh executive order right so everybody is allowed to lobby both sides of the aisle right to get what they want except us right we've got to end this bullshit it's ending slowly it's ending slowly thank god i just hope it's not too late all right that's all i got i'm sorry i'm running my damn mouth oh. <laughs> reciprocity rest a goddamn prosody there's no such thing. Shut up, mule. <laughs> get it. You. <laughs> you will never get this goddamn carrot. <laughs> you just do it the hell I told you to fucking do. John, what you got, man? Nah, nah yeah, you're right, man. You're right. It's just that, yeah, the, like, all you guys is right, man. You know what I mean? We talk about this shit all the time, but it's like they just want us to carry water for everybody, man. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like it, it's fucking crazy though. Like it's just crazy how they be doing this, man. It's like they'll come to us like when any, anything happened, 
the border or, or the Asian hate. Come on, black people. And then the people would be like, uh, like, like, uh, I don't know about that. What the mm-hmm. fuck? All the black, you anti black. I mean, you're anti Asian or you're anti. They coming at us. They're so fire. privileged. Blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. Yeah. Yep, yeah. We've seen it now with it, with Israel Palestine. Uh, the new, yep. this new wave in Israel of the Israel Palestine conflict. Everybody's talking about what are black people going to do for the Palestinians? What? What? What, what the <laughs> fuck? Okay. So, can, so there's four of us on here. Can we take a poll? Who would like to exchange the Asian as in Chinese or Japanese wealth rate exchange and be called nerd or <laughs> be called <laughs> <laughs> some other derogatory name at the levels that Asians have experienced for the past year to 18 months. Who oh, I'll take who, that in a minute. Who, who, who uh, would, who would, who would, who would take the racial exchange? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm like, Mookie, so fuck you, pay me. We have to do, we have to do a verbal roll call because people can't see us raising our hands. So, so the Khaleesi is an I. Mm-hmm. MG. MG, MG is an I. John, you got. I'll be a rich. I'll be a rich. I. <laughs> With what? the ER on it. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna be a rich. I'm saying that, that you can't punch people in the face for calling you that because yeah, Asians yeah, yeah. have every right to punch you in the face if you start calling yeah. them derogatory names because that's yeah. they. But mm-hmm. but what I'm saying is. <laughs> I'm glad you there. Yeah. All right. Definitely. So that's See? four for four. So right now, Black Americans will trade places with you, rich, chi- with you, rich Chinese and Japanese people who and people Indians. are calling you bad names, and you people are catching the random ass whooping. Yes, we will exchange. We would like mm-hmm. to trade. So yep. if you give us your money, we will switch and we will fight anti Asian hate. Yeah, the, the next, the next, uh, um, uh, the next Asian draft, you guys can have what's his name, uh, uh, Eddie back, and we'll take the cash. What's his name, <laughs> Eddie Wong? You can have, y'all have Eddie Wong back, and we'll take the, and we'll take the cash. <laughs> it's a heartbeat. Right, anything else, y'all? Before I go back, because you know, no. did you see? Did you see the thing on Twitter where they was talking about how they have like a really high depression rate now because of? Every the racism that they've been experiencing over the past year, like a lot of people, a lot of them have had to seek the like fuck? therapy and stuff because now they feel on edge and they're worried about what can happen to them on the day to day. Welcome to a peace. Not even a real piece, like a not even like ten percent of what it is to be a black American descendant of chattel slavery. Ten percent. Welcome to ten percent. But that's part of it, right? They think that that sort of stress is meant for us. That kind of shit is meant for us. Yeah. They're supposed to get that shit. They're that's supposed to be treated that like is. that. Mm-hmm. They're supposed to be harassed by the cops. They're that's supposed why, to be picked that's on. That's why they keep blaming the. That's why they keep blaming the anti-Asian hate on black people. Mm-hmm. Even, Even though, though when you look at the numbers, it's happening more from white people. And mm-hmm. 68% of this hate is verbal violence. Verbal violence. Get the fuck you know, out of here. Count all of the verbal <laughs> violence that black people Get yeah, the fuck out of here. You couldn't stand. I you, didn't you, call you, and tell anybody the multiple times I was called in, in, in Los Angeles. There was no hotline. There's still no hotline for me to call. And who do I call? Who do I call the next time I get called? In? Well, so just long. Make, so I can make sure it's counted. I just want to make sure it's counted on the hate crime. Man, the, the whole fucking uh, phone system would be burnt the fuck <laughs> up. And this is what, like you said, Sam, 68% it was verbal. Verbal! 68% is verbal. Verbal. I'm not saying verbal doesn't turn into violence eventually, but God damn, you couldn't stand one roasting the, session? Think about all the verbal violence, all the, all the verbal racist violence I got from the liberal left. Who was I supposed to be calling to get this shit along? <laughs> like, during the election year, I got at least 100 in bombs that year. I wish they, I wish Twitter wouldn't have taken down my old account just so I could Man. go back and pull all the racist vitriol that I got from the left. 
but let's be clear we're not being anti-immigrant because somebody's gonna say it right no. we're being we're being honest about how immigration policy has impacted black americans since the beginning of this country right america has always imported people to leapfrog over us as for everything that they want and that has not stopped it has never stopped right no matter what group it is no matter what region of the world th and right now because america has failed uh in, in, with uh education policy the immigrant they're, they're importing people from all over the world and it's not just black folks to get into this treatment now that's why people are mad you know what i mean I, and it is and it is what it is if you you would not need to go outside of this country for employees for anything if our education system worked properly but that's only part of the story the other part of the story is they're trying to keep down the cost of labor yeah right so all these people trying to silence silence people on immigration policy you need to look at why they're trying to silence you right there's more to it than just they're taking our jobs but oh also and please understand one other thing when i say immigrants i include you white immigrants too Y'all like to sit here and pretend like everybody who's an immigrant is a poor child from Honduras who's escaping gang violence. And no, some people, a lot of you people got here on planes. If you are going to come to us talking about you want to have a coalition, like you need to fight for our causes and then we can fight for your causes. That's the exchange. Mm -hmm. um, Reciprocity. Yeah. And, and we come first. Yeah, I mean, basically, this is the situation we're in, where we we're the people that are in the most need. So if you if you're talking about a coalition, then then the priority needs to go on us. Um, but also, yeah, to to talk about this shit, yeah, it's just a consistent history of like, you know, uh, other groups being brought in to depress wages, to to push us out of industries. And to be the buffer class, like this, this, mm -hmm. this, this is really what it is. And like the the problem I have, like that we're all having, is that we can't even have a conversation about this without people then pointing the finger at us, like we're the ones that are promoting hate. And mm -hmm. I mean, we can show you every time. Like I don't have to talk about Mexicans and Latinos. I can talk about the Irish and the Italians mm -hmm. and show how immigration fucked me. I don't have to talk about any immigrant who got here since 1980 to prove my case on how immigration mm -hmm. affects black Americans. So y'all can take your feelings yep. out. Yep. We ain't got to go yep. past 1980. So y'all can't see here because then I'm a racist towards, uh, towards Irish people who've been Americans for a hundred years. <laughs> F out of mm -hmm. here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that's what I mean. Here's the other part about it. Like, we can't even talk about, like, their anti-Blackness, even though they would admit their anti-Blackness. For some reason, us talking about their anti-Blackness means that we hate them. It's kind of like the thing that, like, the game that white people play. And it's 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 strange. It's like they'll, they'll punch you in the mouth, like, and then come to you, like, a week later and not understand why you're not being friendly with them. <laughs> like, that's, yeah. that's the type of mentality <laughs> that they have about this whole thing. And it's mm -hmm. like, it seems like all these groups kind of have that. And mm -hmm. I don't know what exactly it is because like we can have the conversation about how, uh, you know, anti-blackness has been exported through the media and all of this. And then like the power dynamics of like just being an immigrant and coming to a new country and like how you, you try to make it through that country. Mm -hmm. But I don't know why that that part of it like exists like I would think that it would be obvious what our position would be at all of this like we are the people that have been in this society and we're at the bottom and you're coming to this society um or you're not going to consider our situation and what our politics might be in all of this at all Ooh, give it to him man all right we going forward yeah, I'd like Anybody to go else? back to the video. I just think it was a good point for us to kind of get off on this little thing because I know it was the stereotype part, but I just think, like I said, we have to keep addressing like allyship and what race, ethnicity, and all of that means in allyships. The lesson I got when I was a kid from my dad was that your job is not to understand a culture, but respect the culture. And when I was young, I didn't really realize what that meant, but it had a profound impact on me. And I never saw that I was different. 
I wasn't treated I was different, and I think this is a minority. I don't think this is the case for everybody. But for me, because of that lesson before that I've had all throughout my life, and when I got there, I understood that it's a culture and I respected it, and I think there was a vibe that came from that too, mm -hmm. right? I was able to receive and I was also able to give. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that, I was able to not have that as I grew older. Actually, growing up, I thought my brother was black. Um, because he had a lot of black friends, all I saw was his black friends, it's all he hang, hung out with. So I would go to school and say, hey, I have a black brother, you know, trying to make friends. <laughs> like, I was so adamant, and then, like, That's my mom- That's an interesting way to make friends. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, okay. <laughs> and I was like, like eight or something. Right. I was like, yeah, my brother is black, so I was like, cool like I never had any bad ideas about black people it wasn't until I started like really watching the news that I learned oh my gosh like you know they're getting stereotyped for things that I've never even seen a black person do we can keep rolling but I just like the fact that she admitted that media has a big role in the anti-blackness because if she would have never been around black people, she would have thought like, oh, that's just how black people are. It just happened that she grew basically eight years old. She grew up with black people. <laughs> so that's why she was like, I've never really seen black people do some of the things I've seen stereotyped in the media. So I, I like that little piece because that just shows like if you don't have exposure to black people, it's very easy for you to be anti-black because you live in an anti-black country, an anti-black American descendant of child of slavery country to be more exact. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the big reasons why they want us to live apart. Redlining and all this other stuff that's been going on for, since we've been here. They want us to live apart because they don't want people, to, we, they don't want us to understand each other, right? Mm -hmm. Because once you get around people and you realize, okay, these there's some assholes on every side of this, every side of every fence. Exactly. So you start to realize, okay, that and you can have conversations and real conversations, and but it is what it is. We are what we are. All right, let's ride. Anybody else got anything? I'm sorry. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna repeat myself, but I'm just gonna say this: the the second half of that, I didn't hear that the first time. So that kind of changed my perspective on what she said. Like, um, I don't know. I still feel funny about her just like confusing like her brother with being black just because he hung out with black people. But in her child mind, blackness and race was not an issue that she, it was so confusing to her that as she became older and realized, oh, that they're actually doing these people wrong. Um, it actually set in, but like the fact that she didn't like it's basically she didn't have any racist like racism in her, I guess would be the mm -hmm. um what what it sounds like from what, what she described. Like she didn't even understand the concept. So I can actually I can actually elaborate on that. I grew up, I went to private school until I was in the eighth grade. I went to school with maybe maybe half of the kids were white. But after that, it was the United Nations. So there was a few, there was always like three to four black Americans in the class, max. And then after that, I would I had Egyptian kids that I went to school with. I had mm -hmm. Indian kids whose parents were from Mr. India. Danya. Yeah, from India. I had mm -hmm. um I had people in my um I had a I had a, a a white Latina friend who was from, I forgot where her parents are from. She's an actress. Yeah, her name's Odette Usman. So uh, yeah, so I grew up with all kinds of people, but we were all kind of relatively raised white. So we were all kind of similar. So like, yes, I look at you and yes, we're not the same. And yes, my parents at home are telling me you're black. You have to work twice as hard. Your experience will be different. But I, it didn't all connect for me until I became 18 and moved out of the city that I grew up in and moved into the into the larger world. That's when I started experiencing more racism. The only racism I really experienced as a child came from mainly like white women. And that was more like school stuff like that, but white women, including my dad's second wife, who was a white Latina. So yeah, that's that. So that's, so I understand what she's saying. What she's saying is, where the way she grew up, she was just immersed with blacks. So being so the blackness was not a thing for her. It's like a fish in water. 
you would never ask fish in water like mm-hmm. what is water but then like you take them out like oh God, damn I'm dying like can't breathe this is whole it's different so i understand this like i get what she's saying because i went through the same thing like i got my n- wake up call wake up Megan. i'm gonna go wake up calls a bitch like <laughs> i was like yeah yeah <laughs> This but I was special. What was talking about. <laughs> I, no, 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 no. I was, I was, I was like, damn. I thought racism was over. Let me tell you how, how cold <laughs> it was. Like, no, yo, no, how cold it is, right? My homeboy, my homeboy is a tech person, right? We've been friends. We've been <gasps> friends for like fifteen years. I talked him out of going back to college, like, like twelve years ago, because he's a computer tech guy. He does securities, and. Literally, when he would go to conventions, right? He's mm-hmm. the guy you're supposed to talk to because he built the shit and he knows how to make it work. People would come up and go and talk to all the people who he trained and who he would tell to do. Then they'd be like, oh, you need to talk to so-and-so about it. And they would look at him like, oh. he, he was like, before the, he was like, I thought racism was over until I literally started really working in business being great at my job and excelling and people dismissing me at a look and understand when you look at this man this is no thug looking man this is no big dude either like he's five five ten which is average height wears glasses very friendly looking listen very just a regular dude just a regular you know semi good looking guy with a nice smile not big and, you know, not big and, you know, because, you know, mm-hmm. you know, John, you big. So you understand what I'm saying. Just an average height. Yeah, I'm a slave. I'm a slave. I, I, I no, got but slave, you get what I'm saying. I'm saying he's not. I'm saying he's not, threat- <laughs> I'm saying he's not threatening. That's what I'm really trying to say. He is he is a non-threatening black man. So, like I said, he thought racism was over, too, till he started excelling at his job. And everywhere he went, he would go to these trade shows and stuff. And people would be rude to him. And they would just go and try to talk to the people under him. And they have to send him back. And it must be like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm the person yeah. you're supposed to talk to. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Not being threatening doesn't mean that they don't still discount your intelligence. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Preach. So, and honestly, it, I get it. I get it like the weird way because I am a big, you know, black man. So they just think I'm like, you know, like John said, just a, a, a brute. Mm-hmm. But, but when they actually like hear mm-hmm. the words coming out of my mouth, they're like, they they like some white people look at me like like they're watching a magic trick when I talk, and I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> what is that a magic trick? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like what? The fuck? <laughs> That's why. Anybody else before we? No, nah, I'm good, ahead. family. Okay, good. Yeah, I just wanted to throw in that little tidbit because, yeah, that's my experience. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't realize. I knew I was, I knew I was black, but I didn't realize what it meant to be black till after I was over eighteen. <laughs> I knew that I was black, uh, but I didn't understand what it meant to be black until I got over eighteen. That is the difference. My I parents hate- was telling me, but it just wasn't registering. <laughs> like Cosby Show shit. Cosby show, Cosby show. And the only but thing you, they really said is I was going to have to work two times as hard. Like, they wasn't really, even I think about the riots and stuff, like, they didn't even sit down and explain to me why that shit was going on. I understand I was only, like, seven, but we still should have had a conversation, goddamn. Like, when I think about it in retrospect. Yeah, but I, but but that's that's one of the things is is that we think we're protecting our children, but we're not protecting them because eventually they're going to get that nigga wake up a call. Yeah. You can, you know, and 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 also it also go, you know, your the way you were living, you didn't see the racism, right? Nope. You know, the, the way the 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 way they iso- the way they insulated you was, in a way, kept you from realizing what they were saying was true, which is mm-hmm. a dichotomy that a lot of black parents go through. You know, it's like okay, I know my child. Has, I had to prepare my child for for life in a in a white a black life in a white world. But at the same time, we got to go get him this good education. And in those spaces, it's not like the real world. So I just want to share that. No, let's go. <laughs> I, so, I mean, I think especially what it is for black parents that have young kids is that um, it's a hard conversation to have because you don't have the answers. Mm-hmm. 
You got the answer. That's true. Sway. I think though, like a lot of us do, kind of have that that con- those type of conversations, like when they're teenagers and stuff like that, because then we we feel like they they're at a level where they can understand a more complex world. But it's very hard mm-hmm. to kind of have conversations with like little kids. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. It's, it's, it's hard, especially when you kids and a lot of kids are growing up in multiracial communities now, right? Like Sam was talking about, mm-hmm. and you just one of a rainbow. I feel like they think that we kind of have a superiority, almost like white privilege. But in reality, we don't because we do struggle with the same issues. So can people show me where the majority of Japanese or Chinese people are poor? In America. That's going to be a tough one. Now, I'm not going to talk about other Asian groups because their money shakes out differently. I'm just going to talk about Chinese and Japanese and Indian Asian Americans because all three of them have more money than white people. So any prejudice that you experience does not compare to our poverty and racism. But I wouldn't even say they experience Mm -hmm. prejudice on any level compared to us. Like, I think that well, you know. know, you know, people people say Asians can't drive, and that's allegedly racism and prejudice, or that's allegedly prejudice. So I'll yeah, give I'll, them, I'll I'll I'm that giving voice. I'm giving them microaggressions as prejudice because that's what know, they count they, them at. But they also <laughs> have a, they also have a bunch of positive stereotypes, and you know, mm-hmm. damn, damn near all mm-hmm. the stereotypes we have are negative. And, and all, Model minority, yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. the only the only negative stereotype about Asians is that they can't drive. All well, the other that's ones not are the positive. only one, but I ain't gonna, I'm not gonna go that one. I'm I'm trying to be a lady too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's talk about that. Right? Right, that's right. All right. Fond of black people, or if they're not, they they don't have any feeling one way or the other. They just prefer to. Um, be with their own. Not that I fault them, because that's how a lot of different races are. COVID-19 has hit my community harder. <laughs> in, in different ways. Okay, because, because COVID has hit the African-American community hard in regards to us as patients. We are getting it the most. We are dying from it the most. I think it's hit us in that way, but it's hit Asian Americans in the way that you all are experiencing a lot of overt racism that I think a lot of you may not have experienced before. So I've been personally attacked. Boom. So why as a black person do you have to tell Asian people what they have experienced? Why do you as a black person, for you to say what has happened to your community, why do you feel obligated having to talk about what has happened in somebody else's community? And do other groups feel that same obligation? Because I had to get on my fucking congresswoman because she don't really talk about blacks. And she got 14% of us in her fucking district. Like, we still here. I'm just saying. You know what I mean? So, mm. Yeah, I think... I think one of those, I think part of that is is empathy. I think some of us see that as empathy. We I as to say I understand your plight as opposed to listening to their plight. I think that that's that's a lot of times that's how we view it as in I feel your pain and I know this about you. Let's discuss it and hug it out, which is fucking killing us. Um, but I think that's how that's how I think uh, Taylor, the black lady, who spoke first. That's what she meant. Anybody else? Yeah, like what? What? Is, what are we doing here? They knew we were b- being impacted the most, and nothing was done to change the society to try to fix that. Yeah, is everybody that just tried over? to try to get on it and get what they could out of it. Uh, that this is what I'm talking about. This is the difference. This is. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> like maybe I'm just seeing it different than everybody else, but like. I, mm. name calling and maybe a scuffle every now and again I can deal with that but when the so- whole society is just allowing my community to fail that's that's a different type of racism that's the racism I'm trying to stop mm-hmm. I, can, 
And and I understand she said, you know, more overt racism than what you are used to. Asian community, I do not agree with people abusing people in your community. The elderly, the people who have attacked elderly people, I hope that they burn in hell. And like yesterday, that's it. Yeah. Like, period. Like, mm -hmm. that's it. I hope that they burn in hell. I really do. And I hope when they're elderly, I hope somebody knocks them the fuck out so they get their karma for what they did to an elderly person. Because contrary to how a lot of, not a lot, but some Asian Americans have tried to play it like Black people condone that shit. In the Black community, we don't we don't condone putting our hands on on elders. Exactly. That's not, that's not part of our culture. Like, don't don't put your hands on Big Mama and there be some uncles. You get that work. People will drive. People will hop in a car and drive <laughs> to fuck you up for putting your mm -hmm. hands on I'm a Big Mama. <laughs> or a boss i need a day or off a <laughs> am, I, am i lying yep. that is not no mm -hmm. black americans don't not at all mm -mm. you know when i saw that shit i was like the mm -hmm. fuck that's not acceptable so don't even try to put it off on us like we even accept no kind of shit like that so yeah that's <laughs> that's not our thing so a lot of like I said a lot of the racism stuff that's coming like first of all we don't condone it like, like I said, we don't condone hitting old people. To be honest, I don't condone hitting anybody on the day to day. Like, I don't. Everybody should keep their hands to themselves. But you know, one one of these cases, one dude did call the dude a nigga, and then when he choked him up and started beating that ass, it was a hate crime and anti Asian. So, so if you go on run your mouth and get some checks and get it, you know, get that ass whooping. Like, that's different because white people have gotten beaten breaks off of for calling black people niggers, too. So, you know, if you get out here dropping that in bomb, that's, that's yeah. different. Don't cry black people then because you started that shit. Because words can be violent, too. All right. Anything else? I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going with the words can be violent, too, but you can disrespect the motherfucker. Enough to catch an ass whooping. Um, well, your word, if you call me a n you might, you might, um, your words may be so violent in my spirit that I feel hurt <laughs> enough to beat your ass. <laughs> now, do I feel like they're violent, mm -hmm. that they should be persecuted and like actually brought up and stuff like that? No, not that kind of violence. But, nah. but if you hurt my feelings bad enough that I get in my feelings enough to overreact and beat your ass. Yeah, violence begets violence. Because if you wouldn't have said that shit to me, I wouldn't have got in my feelings hurt, got upset, got hurt, and flipped the fuck out and choked the shit out of you. Verbally attacked by people uh, for being Asian. You know, did the protocol, I said six feet apart, but they asked me to move further away because they treated me like I was just a full on virus. I've seen my grandma get yelled at. That I feel is our, like it's the Asian experiencing what black people have experienced, although it's not the same thing. It's, oh, you're, you're Asian, so you're a virus, you know? It's just... so, like, Your grandma got I yelled at? I passed out by <laughs> Chinese people at the Japanese market when I was just trying to get some sushi, and a nice okay. Filipina lady had to come in and save me from them because, like, they literally kept following me when I would move to the back of the line to get away from them. So, And they literally kept following me around, verbally attacking me until a Filipina lady cussed them out and shame them and told them how people like them are the reason why people don't like Asians. What? Like, <laughs> your grandma got yelled at and that's racism? Like, I mean, I understand. Like, I get it. But, like, come on, man. If they yelled at your grandma at the store, like, come on, man. <laughs> like, you know, my grandma lived through Jim Crow, man. She was a sharecropper, like, you know what I mean? Because did your grandma yep. go through that? Man? Like, what are you talking yep. about? Like, come on, man. This shit is crazy. Man. Yep, <laughs> liable to be raped by the by the landowner at 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 at, a, at will. And when you say by a landowner at will, there's that vice video where the gentleman talked about how his family was kept on the plantation into the late 1950s, and how his mama got raped in front of him as a child. So that's the 40s. That's, yeah, that mean, ain't no hundred years away. That ain't no hundred years ago. It's just that, like. 
we need to come up with a new term because yeah racism is dead like the word racism is dead because people have appropriated it for microaggressions like these days if i say oh your hair is wavy that's a microaggression that's racism that's like that's how small white people think it is now because everything has become racism yeah i mean it's just that this shit just doesn't hold the same weight it's not fair to compare uh, it's apples and oranges yeah it's just not fair to compare this these, these experiences and can we all agree that y'all chose y'all chose y'all chose to immigrate to a racist country that had a history of exploiting killing and raping black americans who descend from slavery they had a history of oppressing us in this country and y'all came here for a chance at the bag that's it that's what you so this was your choice so you don't get to blame shit on black people you gotta fight your fights I don't think it's okay that people call other people mean names. But again, I will exchange the wealth level of the Indian Asian American community, the Chinese American community, the Japanese American community. I will exchange your wealth at any moment and take the amount of racism that you endure at any time. We will happily exchange. You can take our you can take our negative wealth. And we'll take our negative wealth <laughs> and we'll take your money and we'll take your microaggressions. You can... I would it. I'm with it, sis. That sounds like a good deal to me. You're but... just mad because you thought so can we just be real? BIPOC, black immigrants, people of color, y'all are getting y'all America is a racist country wake up call. Y'all thought y'all came here to get the bag and that y'all was just going to be able to jump over Black Americans and everything's going to be gravy because people only hate Black people, right? Nope. It's, it's hard because I actually help a lot of small businesses and a lot of, when I open their books and see what they can do, I literally have to give them objectively, you can't make it. You have to pivot. And they don't know how to do anything else, right? And I don't want to compare, but these are immigrants who literally don't know how to do anything else. So what are their opportunities next? So from that perspective, yeah, I think um, our community has been hit harder. I think- First of all, uh, what the didn't fuck over did half of say? black businesses oh. close during the pandemic? Yes. And second of all, we ain't got businesses like y'all got businesses. So what do we do on a regular basis when we don't have no businesses and don't know what else we gonna do? Like you gonna go get a job like the rest of us do. Exactly. <laughs> so, she better go get the J-O-B. Like go ahead. What were you saying, John? They better get the J-O-B. Like Pops for Friday. J-O-B. I want you to get your ass up today. Go out and look for a job. The word today is job. J-O-B. <laughs> for real. Like, I was like, come on, man. Like, like. Like, like, we already know, like, you know what I mean? A lot of our businesses got hit harder. Like, we got hit harder economically, health-wise. And a lot of the jobs, like, I remember when the COVID first hit, they started shutting down a lot of, a lot of say, you know, we work these jobs where you can't work remotely. A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people lost their fucking jobs. Like, mm -hmm. still ain't working right now. So it's like, we, come on. Like, come on, man. This is crazy, bro. And shit, they about to get evicted. Like, when all these little, um... June. June yeah. is the end of the moratorium. Yep. I got to get all my bills paid up. Yep. Not because um, not because I'm my house, but I got to pay up like my lights and shit. My lights and my power. I got to get them their money. All right. We got anything else for him or shall we go to this brother? Because this brother go. Whew. I think I'm going to personally feel just because of what I've seen happen this whole year surrounding what's happened. I'm going to feel like there's been more disadvantage. Um, but I know people that have been equally disadvantaged in terms of, you know, you're not, you're, you know. See, boom, there's the problem. He did it. I've been, I, I would say we've been more disadvantaged, but I would say other people have been equally disadvantaged. At, you did not, y'all, <laughs> just talk about yourself. Yeah.
Just talk about yourself. Talk about what you know. Yeah, stop talking about other people. Like, let other people speak for themselves. You see what they Asian are, do? They Asian are do. grown people. Let their grown. Com- Sorry, go ahead, John. They're grown community. Go ahead, John. Uh, no, you, no, you're absolutely right. You see how Asian dude did it. Asian dude was talking about the store, what they're gonna do because they can't work at the store now. He ain't say nothing like, and black people can't. They can't. He ain't say nothing. And black, just, and, but I understand exactly. that half of the black businesses closed. Nope, none of that. <laughs> word, word. Take but, a yeah. note from your so-called allies. If every time your allies talk about their issues, they don't include you in it, they're not your allies. And that's why I said we can't be allies. Like to, at this moment, there is no alliance with Black Americans. There is no formal alliance with Black Americans from any group, not a single one, because nobody's really proposed one. Like you got to pull a gun on somebody to get them to put reparations on the platform, i.e., White People's Party. I still see y'all. Reparations still ain't on that shit. That's why I don't even pay attention, y'all. Y'all don't even exist to me no more. But see, this is why I, I say he should have spoke about what he knows, because this is the opportunity to like compare notes. You you know, the Asian guy thinks it's so bad because of how businesses have been affected in the Asian community. We'll talk about how businesses have been affected in your community. And then yep. once once you put those things next to each other, then you understand that we have not been equally impacted. <laughs> it, it's been a total different level of impact. I am always here for the oppression Olympics. Definitely. I don't give a fuck. People are like, let's not play the oppression Olympics. That's because you bastards will lose. Nobody can beat Black Americans in the oppression Olympics in the United States of America. Dealing Those with medalists. the United States of America. So you can't come here talking to me about what happened in your country because that country did that shit to you. This country did not. So, that's it. Talk about your hey, let's, experiment. Let's, huh? You give Sam the gold medal. You give Sam the gold medal on the black power glove. Like, that's like very, <laughs> what are we going to say, like, but What did you say, but I, I said, I missed it. talk about your American experience. That's it. You know what I'm saying? That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. And that's all. That's all we need. Yeah. And <laughs> like John said, we're gold medalists on this land. Gold. We got the gold, bro. Talk. Real, do, do the pose with the black power glove. We getting the gold. <laughs> We've been through a lot. We've been through a lot, man. Shit, okay, but yeah, that's know. yeah, no, yeah. We the winners. I'm sorry. I hate I hate to tell you this, Native Americans. Not even Uh-oh. y'all get to beat us in the oppression Olympics. Y'all can come <laughs> come at me, bro. <laughs> But this might have to be two parts because I need it to be an hour each because I don't want nobody to miss it when I say it. Yep, yep. I'm sorry. I'm going to say even Native Americans cannot. I'm, oh, hold on, hold on. MG's about to come back. I'm a, you ready, MG? I just said, <laughs> you ready for it, MG? This is, wow. this is some shit we, people going to come at us on Twitter. They going to come at, at us on. on the comments. You ready? It's on. It's on. You ready? Uh-huh. In the Oppression Olympics, nobody is... We are the winners. Not even Native Americans can compete with us in the Oppression Olympics. <laughs> Uh-oh. And let me tell you why. Sharon, Americans, sister Sharon. Because <laughs> Native Americans, not all, but the five tribes, they at least tried to pay them reparations or were paid reparations. And then there are still treaties and you still have seen Things being worked out as since 1946 all the way going up till now with the shit that's being done in Oklahoma and everywhere else. Plus, that's true. Casinos and some other shit. Are some reservations fucked up? Yes. But are there people at the top who have all the money who are oppressing and fucking you? Yes. You guys are your own nation. That is an in-house problem. I don't know enough about your situation. I'm not going to go no further than what I just said. But that sounds like y'all got a class problem in your house. We have a problem with this country who has continued to oppress us and give us nothing. Plus y'all own slaves too. So y'all owe us some money too. We didn't own you. Mm -hmm. Can't really argue with that. We didn't own you know that, and and mm-hmm. to 
to go a step further. Y'all have expelled us from your tribes to make sure that we have it, that we didn't get what we were supposed to get from you. Leave so, them Negroes outside. So, yes. And I they were told, and they were told specifically to, to keep us in the, the tribes. They were told I, to keep us in the tribes. Yep. They cut I, us anyway. I 100% fuck with the Oppression Olympics. We are gold medalists, as John said. You ain't pushing us off our platform. Y'all ain't been here long enough, and we got to die out first, or our oppression has to end and yours really, truly begin. And in 400 years, you can talk to us about what you've been through. But until then, people of choice, What you are owed in this country is as an American immigrant. You are owed a standard of living as an American citizen. You just happen to be an immigrant. You are owed nothing for being a person of color. Because you chose to come here. So you're a person yep. of choice. And don't say, mm-hmm. well, things are so bad in my country. I didn't choose to come here. They were just bombing us and raping us. <sighs> in Chicago cannot flee to Canada or Mexico because of the gang violence or anything the fuck else. I'm and we're, and we're not the only country taking people. That's bullshit. We're not the only country taking people. Europe is taking people. There are other countries that are well, quote unquote second world countries are not as bad off as those as those countries that, that are having problems. They are people come coming through how many countries to even get yes, here in the first place. They're leapfrogging so, other countries to come here. Right? So don't give me I don't I you know I hate I hate to be that asshole, but don't give me that bullshit. You chose to come here because this is the land of opportunity. We the descendants of chattel slavery, our people, our ancestors created that opportunity that you're coming to take advantage of. Fuck a you. Exactly. So when you get here, say thank you. For those of you who are still here, Black mm-hmm. Americans who descend from chattel slavery deserve reparations. And y'all need to get with us on that fight. And we will fight with you as a collective for America. For America to be better for Americans, all Americans. And again, you as an American immigrant, you are owed a certain standard of living as an American, but you are owed nothing for being an immigrant. Sorry, you didn't build this country. You didn't contribute in that way. And they'll say, oh, but the Chinese, that is a small, small microcosm of people. And if you want to go and track those people who descend from those specific Chinese people who helped with finish the railroads, because the majority of the railroads was built, baby, by slaves. The westward expansion that went up into the westward expansion at the end, they came in at the end and did a lot of that work. So, yes, they contributed. So if you want to go through and talk about those family members, but that's not people who got here 30, 40 years ago. You can't conflate them all into the same box. Quit playing me. That's a lineage thing. If you want to go deeper, their lineage is somewhat different. But I but I don't want to get into that because people really going to get mad at me because, again, contribution matters. So, you know, you're, you're Asian, but you're not American, you know, and, and, and putting COVID on people or calling it the Kung flu or the Chinese virus. You know, these are these are things that that affect both of our communities. When I first moved here, I took advantage of the beach and I decided I would wake up in the morning and go for a run. Someone um, walked by me and started saying something to me and I didn't hear him necessarily. It was an older black man and he called me some racial slurs and had alluded to. Uh, Did you catch where she said she didn't hear him necessarily? So if you didn't hear him necessarily, how do you know he said a racial slur? You contradicted yourself off it. Did y'all catch that? Yeah, but maybe the story goes into more detail where she does find out that's what was actually said. Let's see to me being Asian, me being dirty and eating bats, and I'm the cause of COVID happening. I face more racism from the opposite side than I do from my So, movie. first of all, first of all, for context, she said she was running at the beach, right? Right now, in depending on where she is, and I'm pretty sure she's in California, and I would bet that she's even more so in L.A., And if she is in L.A. and if you are running at the beach, there is a very high homeless population and encampments across the beaches. 
So it is very possible that there was some crazy homeless black person who screamed racial slurs at her while she was running on the beach. For context. Yeah. I also think that uh, I don't know about this. I don't know what to think of that because she said she didn't quite hear it. And then she goes into detail about them eating bats. Like that's, that's very specific. I, like you heard that. <laughs> if that's what yeah. you said. So I don't know. <laughs> All right. Next one. Oh, this is going to be my favorite one. This is going to be 10 minutes. This is going to be 10 minutes. Oh, I'm so ready for this. Sorry, go ahead. What happened? Uh, <laughs> sorry, my internet went out. I more racism from the opposite side than I do from white people. I'm mad at you other Negroes for not sitting down. Just me. <laughs> Um, I think it's true for me, but it's, it's, I think I'm a special case given the fact that the industry I work in, I work in the tech industry. I face a lot of just rude comments, ignorant comments, and just um, unnecessary oh. things that are said to me by Asian people. I've had um, mm -hmm. a few Asian coworkers that uh, told me that the way that I talk is inappropriate that my tone and my voice is inappropriate for the workplace and I need to change that. I need to become more Americanized. And he said, don't worry, nobody else is going to tell you that, but I'm going to tell you that. And I get that. What she needs fuck? to become more Americanized hey. after 400 plus years of being in this country. She needs to become more Americanized. What is more American than black motherfucking culture? Please take out all the black culture out of this country. This country will be bored and non-prosperous. Yeah, it, it's it's real insulting to say we're un-American, um, especially because what she's really saying is that we aren't acting like the white people. When, yeah, she's saying we're not white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when the vast majority of the white people haven't been here as long as we've been here. Stop, pause, rewind that mug. What do you mean the majority of white people haven't been here that long compared to us? Because the vast majority of them are immigrants that came after us. You, you know, so it's like it, it's it's crazy because we are the Americans. Pretty much. A lot of white people are thirds. A lot of white people are like third generation at best, maybe fourth. Yeah. And we're like eight, nine, ten generations deep. But we're not American. But we built this motherfucker. We built this country for you and your people to come here. This hey, yo, this is why I always say, like, man, when it comes to people of color, like, if your American story started with you on a plane eating peanuts, watching the water boy, <laughs> like, <laughs> if you came over there on the plane eating peanuts, watching Adam Sandler movies on the 12-hour flight, like, then you come here and somehow we in this together and, like, come on, man. The fact that, you know, you have Asian people, these are probably recent one first generation immigrants telling this sister, like, you not speaking the right way. You speaking with a certain tone. This shit isn't fucking insane, man. This shit is insane. You know, so that's all I got about this shit. This shit's crazy. Yeah, no, it's 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 wild to me. Like I said, it's so wild to me because we always get this, well, we're all brown and we're all oppressed and we should just all be together. It's like, no, no, no. The immigrant story and the black American story are not the same. Can we just appreciate each other for having different stories? Why do you have to force me into being your story? You and I can't be the same because I'm not an immigrant, like off rip. Like, so why can't I appreciate you for your story and you appreciate me for mine without trying to force me, without co-opting my story and forcing me into your... That's, that's why key. this whole... Co-opting our story, that's the key. Yeah, you co-opting our story. Like that whole America is a nation of immigrants. Um, No, America is a nation of former, of uh, slave descendants, native descendants, colonizer descendants, and people who immigrated after that. That is what this is. And if you wanna go into immigration, you can go into the waves. Then I do my white coworkers. <laughs> um, so the only reason why I didn't come up and agree is because I have experienced a lot of racism from Asians just because I lived in an Asian neighborhood, but I really think 
that's it. I've lived in a white neighborhood, predominantly white neighborhood. I've lived in a predominantly East Asian neighborhood. And personally, I prefer living in a predominantly East Asian neighborhood because in my experience, they leave us alone. Like they're, we're, they're not necessarily like super neighborly, but I'm not really looking for that. Like the racism I've experienced from white people is so much more like in your face. It's uh, hard for me to hear these things because as somebody who's also working, you know, I wor worked at a tech company before and I'm always a manager in position and to have somebody talk to someone like that, I, I, I don't think our community as a whole this is not the representation, I don't think they would give the same respect that you guys are giving. And um, it's not right. It's, it's not right. The fact that you can do that and give us the benefit of the doubt is um, it's so kind. <laughs> it's, um, I don't think we deserve it. And um, yeah, I overall think that Asian communities are very racist. Not only racist against just there are a lot of inner racism. There's a lot of Southeast, oh, uh, yeah. South and East uh, racism that's prevalent. There's clear black, white, there's racism a lot. But the fact that we are getting the benefit of the doubt that I know that you guys have never been able to get from this culture and you guys are still having the compassion to do it. Really, I thank you. I think it's a very important discussion to have, um, especially I think as an Asian American, I've seen a lot of hypocrisy come from our side, um, and I think I wanted to um, have an opportunity to talk in a safe form about it. Asian Americans are more advantaged than Black Americans. Well, we all agree. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, I kind of think um, Asian American privilege is white privilege. I think a lot of my success and opportunities that I got was purely be because of how people judge my skin color and ethnicity. They thought I was smart. They thought um, I spoke eloquently. They thought I fit a minority profile into their culture, whatever it may be. But I've never had a negative stereotype, which means I have an inherent advantage, which is the whole principle of white privilege, right? So I think I'd be very disingenuous in saying that I didn't get a lot of my successes or opportunities just because of, I'm Asian. Yeah, I feel like there was that whole thing of good and bad stereotypes is really important. I would love some of those like good stereotypes. <laughs> like when everybody thinks you're a thug or everyone thinks you're ghetto or everyone thinks yeah. that you're somebody's baby mom, especially the age I'm at now, mm -hmm. like that are all negative stereotypes and does affect me. It does affect me in the workplace. I would love to work like walk into the workplace and everyone assume, oh, she's the smartest in the room, or she went to a UC, or whatever good stereotype that is associated with Asian people, I would love to have that. And that's an advantage in some way because it allows you to have more opportunities where someone's making a quick judgment and they say, okay, who I'm going to work with. If they don't know you, they may pick that Asian person because there's 100%. already those assumptions that's already there. So I do feel like East Asians actually have it better than Southeast Asians in terms of, that too. because we're, darker yeah. you know it's, it's all at the end of the day it's all in, in skin tone yeah i would echo that i definitely think it's based off of skin tone yeah, if you're east asian chinese taiwanese korean you have in my opinion more advantages than someone who's filipino like my mm -hmm. friend who was filipino told me oh we're the black people of asians yeah so oh. it's but i do think that asian americans have more advantages than black americans because simply you all didn't have to go through the system, systemic oppression that African Americans have had, have had to go through due to slavery. Yeah. Absolutely. I think the Asian Americans that wouldn't be here right now and that would disagree are the people who bought into the model minority myth mm -hmm. because that was basically brought on to us as a way to somehow align us with whiteness in the sense mm. that, yeah, we're accepted for, because we're smart and we were hardworking and whatnot. And although that's not, tr that's all true, right. it's also saying you're a good minority, therefore there must be a bad minority. <laughs> exactly. right. yeah. And that's so it. that's, that's wedging point. when they want us, we're then on their we're side. Here, right. And then when they don't want us, then they push us aside. Yeah. I wonder often as an Asian leadership in a big company myself, sometimes how people perceive of me. Mm -hmm. Because I, I know that I'm articulate and I fit a lot of that stereotypes, mm -hmm. but I also have a feeling that 
there's a very negative side to it. Exactly. Oh, he's only this, or he can only be this, right. or he's perfect for this, Accepted, right? But an exactly. Outlier. So yeah, that's a whole said. separate struggle, but I would rather have much of that as a negative stereotype for me than a lot of the stereotypes I think black Americans get yeah, yeah. on yeah. a daily day basis where that's not even an opportunity. I think because there's such anti-blackness in the Asian community, even coming from Asia, there's already a bias when you have these first, second generations, there's already that bias there. Yes. But then when they come here, they're taught that black is bad, white is good, don't be like these people. So you're already kind of forming this enemy type of uh, I'm trying to fit in. Yeah, you're, you're forming an enemy based on what you're hearing. Well, I've even heard Asian people say uncool things to me because they're like, oh, you're black, so you're going to steal. So they'll follow me or this look at me, and I'm like, am I going to steal a 25 cents gum? Like, I'm not going <laughs> to risk it all for that, right? So I think it's just like that frustration of you seeing my skin as dirty, and you also see my culture as dirty, and then people come over here and you start pressing me in my country that I help build, my family help build. Mm -hmm. Like, it's that anger that's kind of there, and I feel like that adds to the tension. I don't believe Asian Americans are dumped on as much as African Americans are in America. That is a regular schmegler ass black woman who works a regular fucking job. She is not, pro she is not, she is not out here in the fight. You can tell by just what she said, how she, mm. come on, come on. Say thank you. We built the richest country in the world for you to come here and be prosperous. Now mm -hmm. fight with us so we can fix this bitch and make it right. Yep. White people needed black Dang people to get better fucking rights in this country. Y'all needed us. Y'all need us in the 60s to get the great society. And they and everybody's trying to use us right now to get what they want and leave and still leave us behind. No longer. We will no longer allow you to connect with whiteness and benefit from it. Either we're all going to be piece of shit minorities, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or you're going to fight mm -hmm. with us. So you should be fighting with us so we can fight to mm -hmm. improve the system as Black Americans have always done. So all these people out here talking about, like BLM, I hate them because it because they just didn't do right with the movement. And I hate that because the fact they get so much smoke because they did nothing with the moment movement. But there's a lot of people that are mad at BLM but don't even know the real reason why you should fuck with them. They just don't mm -hmm. like that it says Black Lives Matter. But mm -hmm. my whole Yeah, you're right. They missed the moment. They missed the moment. God, they missed the moment. They missed the moment. I mean, I even I know I know people on my on my job, some of the People that don't even won't even talk to me usually, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much a recluse. I, don't, I stay in my space. Don't bother me. I won't bother you, right? Uh, if you need if you need something from me now, I'm still gonna do my job. But I know I you was happy talk. about quarantine. Oh, jeez, we went, let's not even get into that. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy in a pig and shit. But um, but people were were coming to me and other black folks around saying, "Man, we didn't know. We didn't understand how bad this was." That's what George Floyd did, right? And that's why people work so hard to blunt that impact. That's why George Floyd moved the world. His death moved the world. And as uh, Lord knows, I'm not saying he's, he was he sacrificed himself for, for for to move us forward. Nancy but Pelosi, I hope you burn in hell. My little granddaughter who just turned 12, she said, why is it taking so long? It didn't take that long, but we all saw it on TV. We saw it happen, and thank God the jury validated what we saw, what we saw. So again, thank you, George Floyd, for sacrificing your life for justice, for being there to call out to your mom. How, how heartbreaking was that? Thank you, George Floyd, for sacrificing your life for justice for being there to call out to your mom. How, how heartbreaking was that? Call out for your mom. I can't breathe. Yeah, so if there is a hell, if all that shit is true, she's definitely got Even a Even if there isn't one, throw that mm -hmm. fucking bitch's spirit into something that burns. This one's hard because I think the piece is due to the fact of not talking. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's uh, due to anything really, but that is the fact that that's them over there and we're over here. 
Yeah, I think we coexist peacefully, but that doesn't mean we we're like, progressing yeah. together yeah. because we both are just minding our own business. Yeah. But we really shouldn't be because we're both living in the same society that is oppressing both of us in yeah. different ways. Mm -hmm but we don't have the same socioeconomics. And this is where I start to agree with the Kyles, with the KKK Kyles and the KKK <laughs> Crystals and the Sagers. See how she's saying, but mm. we all are in this together, but we're not because Japanese, Chinese, and Indian Asians have more money than white people. So socioeconomically, we are not in this together. You were in a whole different class. A whole different tax bracket. Yep. So it's different. It's apples and oranges. I need you guys to understand that it's apples and oranges. So yes, do you do you experience prejudice? Yes. But was there a system set up specifically for you to fail? No. There was actually systems set up specifically to make things better for you. Like they said, creating the model minority myth, the fact that Asian, the APPI, the AAPI community has gotten a, um, an economic empowerment act since Clinton's era. The fact that they get the Asian community is like 3% of the population, but they get over 6% of the business loans where black people are 14% of the population and we get 1% of the business loans. Okay. So how is this the same? Show me how the show me how this apple and this orange are the same. Y'all got anything else? I know Mud wanted to finish it up, but I had to get I had to throw that out there. It's a little bit different for the the um, Asians who were over here before uh, sixty five. Like they had they went through some strife, and that's probably why the Japanese. Let's say before forty, outside of the Japanese, so yeah. it's like forty five. Because after World War One, they actually. Weren't they accepted? And then World War II, and then shit happened with the Japanese and they got interned. Well, the Japanese have like a different trajectory than the Chinese. The Chinese went through some bullshit in the beginning and mm -hmm. then they got excluded and they kind of, over and, time kind of worked out for them. The Japanese and the Indian, and the Indian Asians, they fought mm -hmm. to be white people pretty much off rip. Well, the Indians didn't mm -hmm. really come against any significant numbers until 65. Yeah. And like Kamala, Kamala's mama was here before, but she's like on the same level of uh, Barack Obama's daddy. They're yeah. One of those small percentages of. Yeah, those education visas are different. Yeah. That got to come here. Yeah. Before that's... 1965. Please go ahead, Mud. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going. Those little, uh, you know, smattering of like college students is a little bit different. But mm -hmm. we're talking about like people who were, you know, who just immigrated yeah. just regular. Yeah. Um, the Japanese, like they faced discrimination, but they were able to like build their own thing economically and they were kind of left alone until World War Two. And then that's where they really got to, you know, that worked. Yeah, they got a wake up call, <laughs> I guess, or the <laughs> Japanese wake up call. Um, yeah. And then like if we're talking about those groups, um, it's a little bit different, but it's probably why those Japanese who have been in turn have been supporting our, our fight for reparations. And uh, we haven't really seen that amongst the, these other Asian communities. Because mm -hmm. they all came after 65, after we did all the heavy lifting. After we took all them ass whoopings. After, yeah. after our heel took all the ass whoopings and all the beatings and all the murders, then y'all show up and say shut up niggas get over it we got here and we made it why can't you because we fought so white people would get their boots off people's neck and y'all should be happy that white people didn't give you the white people treatment when you first got here because white people treatment and i'm talking about old school white people treatment when they used to run in and burn your whole town well first they would run in and they would murder your daddy then they would run off your brothers and your sisters then they would take all the good shit out your house then they would burn it down and then normally within a couple of years, they would buy that property because it was abandoned and they would buy it for the cost of the taxes. That's what white people used to do to black people in this country. Nader period. Right after slavery. Sorry, I, I know we said we were going to finish this. I'm sorry. Anything else? I'll press play. I'm sorry. But not, I mean, I Go guess. Ahead, John. The, yeah, with the, uh, 
she she trying she's trying they trying to do it they trying to say we all in this together like uh, and it's like like <laughs> nah we not all in this together and she's trying to link our oppressions like as as a similar oppressions and stuff it's not they don't Asians is then as you said earlier like there is no systemic racism systemic racism against Asians they deal with prejudice and bigotry and stuff like that surface level shit. But systemic racism is we're going to burn down Chinatown now. We're going to burn Chinatown down. We're going to freeze all the Chinese bank loans. We're going to burn all this shit down, take the shit, and really, really start wowing on you. Really cut you off economically and do all this other shit to you. They don't, come on. That's not their story. And then uh, and, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Please, please. Sorry, John. I, I hate to cut you off. But I just want to say with your yeah. story, what you just said then. Now, imagine if white America did that to Chinatown. <laughs> How fast would the Chinese government jump mm -hmm. in? Still and doing say, it. no, 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 you can't do this to our people, even if they are now American citizens, maybe, but they still are Chinese people, and you can't do this. Even yep. if you've been here for a hundred years, you're still backed by a government, even if you're not a Chinese citizen. Mm -hmm. On yep. that type of scale. Like, yep. if they start killing Chinese people in mass over the next few years, the Chinese government would speak out and say something. Well, it might be a fucking war. Might be like what war happened with the shit. Italians. When they hung yep. those Italians, they had to apologize to the Italian government and they gave the family members reparations. Yeah, and then I was going to say, like, and then it was also, like, I remember um, uh, Tony DeLaramie of uh, TD Media Hip Hop did something where he did the research where it was, like, after the Korean War, how it was specific, like, after the, the, the Korean War, like, the shit that the United States government did to give, like, South Korean immigrants, like, a leg up in this country, like in the 50s and 60s and stuff like that. That shit is crazy. Like, it's like they had their own little new deal coming over there. Like, so, I mean, like, this shit is like, like, I don't know. And that paper is called Migration and the Korean Diaspora, a Comparative Description of Five Cases by In Jin Yong. The U.S. military involvement in Korea after World War II paved the way for the immigration of large numbers of Korean women and children to the United States during and after the Korean War. The U.S. provided military and economic aid to South Korea to prevent the spread of communism in Asia. After the Korean War, the U.S. provided greater economic aid to South Korea to strengthen its economic stability and thus help the country withstand communism. The U.S. also became Korea's primary supplier of capital and technology, as well as its largest overseas market, helping Korea to build an economic infrastructure and the foundation for a free market economy essential for Korea's continuing economic growth. Starting from the early 1960s, Koreans started export-oriented economic development and the country's standard of living improved steadily. During this period, higher education expanded rapidly, producing a highly educated urban middle class. Members of this class maintained strong motivations for social and economic upward mobility, but they could not all realize their goals in South Korea because of the nation's limited resources and opportunities. After the U.S. opened its borders to increase international National migration in 1965, Koreans began to migrate in search of better economic and educational opportunities. The political and military dominance of the U.S. over South Korea extended to cultural dominance and between 1945 and 1965, about 6,000 Korean students went to the U.S. to seek higher education at colleges and universities. Many of them settled there after finishing their studies and laid the foundation for future chain migrations from their homeland. The first wave of post-1965 immigrants included a high portion of professionals, particularly medical practitioners. These highly educated and skilled workers were preferentially admitted to the U.S. via occupational visa categories until 1976. As more Korean immigrants became U.S. citizens, they began to sponsor their family members' immigration through family reunification preferences. Now let's really take in what I just read and digest it. After the Korean War, the United States literally rebuilt South Korea to the point to where it was so economically sound that there wasn't enough opportunity for all the professionals that were developing in Korea. So much so to the point that the U.S. opened its borders 
particularly to allow the professional class to come into the U.S. and to create an economic foundation for themselves that would then lead to them bringing in their family members in and a chain of other family members in that when they arrive to the U.S., they already have a sound economic base to stand on. What I'm telling you is, is that when you're going around Koreatown here in Los Angeles or anywhere else in the country, don't let anybody fill your head with foolishness that these were poor people that came to the United States and pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. And furthermore, in between 1945 and 1965, Korean students were allowed to come into the United States to pursue higher education. All the while, in that same time period, you couldn't even use the bathroom next to white people. You literally couldn't take a dump next to the white man in between that same time period that the U.S. government had allowed 6,000 Korean students to come in to pursue higher education. Yep, that's how that's how they got in the, uh, in the hair industry. That's how they took over the hair industry. Yep. Government. This is Chosun, one of the most respected newspapers in South Korea. And it's inside the archives of this newspaper that I discovered a document from 1965 in which the wig manufacturers in Korea convinced the Korean government to ban the export of raw hair, making it impossible for anyone to manufacture wigs from the highly desirable Korean hair population except for the Korean manufacturers themselves. And six months after the Korean ban on the export of hair, the United States government banned the import of any wig that contained hair from China. This ban on Chinese wigs virtually locked in the wig business for these South Korean merchants. So it seems that what we're seeing today, the Korean domination of the black hair industry, had its start with the help of both the Korean and the United States government almost 40 years ago. It's oppressing both of us in yep. different ways. Mm -hmm. Why can't we open that door, have this conversation, and try and help each other as far as like helping each other's businesses, you know, working together. We never really see that. And I'm hoping for more of that, honestly. And this is why, and this is why there should be follow-up questions and a moderator, because I want to hit her with the Robin D'Angelo. Well, how would Black people around you know that you would like to see Black and Asians come together in the community? And what work are you doing to bring Black and Asians together? Everyone just see, like assumes that we're natural allies based on some like imaginary, uh, yeah, imaginary shared experience. But if the experience was shared, um, we would already have those connections. Like they, the conversation, like it always seems to be talking around the point that we have never really been connected and there's not really a, a serious effort to connect us. Ooh, I mean, I think, that, I think that we really need to just like kind of come to terms with that and maybe there there just isn't going to be an alliance and we need to accept that fact and maybe start from that point and then come together later on and be like, okay, we do need to align on these certain terms. But as of right now, mm -hmm. I, like, it's just not, it's just not happening. And we need to stop lying to ourselves. Like there's, there's some alliance here. That's true. That's very true. We got to stop playing this game, this this um, this mental gymnastics of, of, of somehow we're working together and we're not and we're not working together at all, you know. And uh, again, what are the institutions doing? That's the biggest one for me. Because that's that's because that's really who, that's who you are. I'm sorry. At the end of the day, who you are is your institutions. And for black Americans, we're being poorly Facts. represented. That's why people don't Very poorly represented. that the majority of Black Americans want reparations and would like to have a conversation about what should be done to help Black Americans. Like, that's... Mm -hmm. 
I'm sorry. Go ahead, guys. I'm just, like I said, our institutions aren't serving as well. But when I look at other people's institutions, when I look at the Latino caucus, when I look at Latino institutions, they are promoting and strictly focused on their own issues. They're not talking about Black people when they talk about their issues. So you as a you as a Latino person, if you feel like there that there should be an alliance between Blacks and Browns, you should be reaching out to your leadership and these people who are in charge of your organizations and telling them that you as a person want to see them doing more to ally with black people. And that goes for every other group. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah. I was just going to say like, uh, like you said earlier, also like um, not just that our institutions aren't are representing us. They, they are kind of selling us out to, uh, also do the work of these other groups mm-hmm. and work in their interests. So it's not like there isn't an attempt to to build the coalition, at least from what our leadership is doing. It's just that no one is like no one is oh, also saying, yeah, no one is also saying, okay, well, what do we have to do to actually benefit the black people? Like no one is actually saying that. Mm-hmm. Not our leadership and not their leadership. Yep. Yep. How many Asian? Who's how you? many Asian? Uh, how many people from the Asian caucus have signed on to reparations? Okay, so um, I think we can coexist peacefully. I just don't think I've seen enough of it. I think that the culture that we're living in right now, everybody's trying to act like we've progressed so far beyond because we're seeing all this stuff on social media, <laughs> yeah. or there are certain things that are not socially acceptable. But um, th- th- there's a problem with that. Because if we don't start talking about things that are potentially harmful that we have within us towards our neighbor, right? I can't love my neighbor effectively if I don't, if I'm not honest with them. Mm -hmm. I think we need to start having more of these controversial conversations and being able to say, okay, you know what? I might have an offensive perspective, but at the end of the day, I need to get over that hump. So I need to be honest with you about some things that I might have had in my life and in my past so that not only can I progress, but I can grow. This has been such like an eye opener just to me, because uh, y'all, y'all some dope people for real. <laughs> like, like y'all are cool. I'm blown away um, by the compassion that mm-hmm. y'all continue to have, and I wish all Asian Americans and Asians in general can learn from that. And I truly mean that from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. What's up? Peace. Okay. <laughs> Peace. Come on. Here you go. Right here. <laughs> Nothing about this was controversial. I love you, Black, but these were the these were some tiptoeing, tiptoe, now tiptoe, now tiptoe, now tiptoe. Okay, that's what was going on. Like the girl with the braids kept the realest. Mm-hmm. And even just the her, kept it the realest. Yeah, she yeah, kept it the realest. So, yeah. Final thoughts, y'all. Bud, Bud, you go first. I want your final thoughts first. Well, yeah, I was just gonna say that. I mean to. I was going to echo what you just said. Like, um, there was nothing really honest about that conversation except for um, what uh, the dark skinned sister had to say. Um, I can't, I wish I remembered her name. I'm sorry. Um, I don't either. The, the, it was the girl with the braids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, she kept it real the whole time. Like, I, I was agreeing with her the most. Um, I don't know what else to really say about this. I, I just think that this was like, this was the what they were trying to do is have a real conversation, but they didn't get either real people or like everybody's being disingenuous for the most part, because like, I don't think that we really got down to like to the core of any real issue here or really like there's a lot of things that should have been said here that just weren't said. And I think that we've kind of talked about those things throughout this whole episode. So, I mean, yeah, we had to fill it in. Yeah. I mean, they needed one of us on the show. That's what they needed. Yeah, they did. Yes. And yes, that's true. Mud, Mud, you ready for your calling when they come calling? So that's what, that's why we'll never be on the show. So when the vice come a calling, who's going on the show? It's going to be you, Mud. Oh, Lord. Anybody else on this? So we can go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, Yeah, well, I think, all right, well, the initial question was, uh, are we allies? And I think walking away from this is, the answer is no. (laughs) The answer is no. 
And uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's no, it's no, without allies, I didn't really gain anything. Uh, getting, I didn't gain anything new from this conversation. Like it was nothing really interesting like that. It was just them hashing out surface levels things, and maybe one day we could talk some more. Like they feel like they feel like they really made an end rule. Like yay, they all give each other elbows. And shit they all make conversations <laughs> with a with a black man. Shit. <laughs> but then when they leave, they go, I got a black friend, friend now. That <laughs> <laughs> Where to tell that Asian dude that owned the company to give niggas some jobs? Like you feel me? Like fucking yeah, elbow. Like, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? If you love you black people like. so much, can you help? Can you get? Can you get? Can you get ten percent? Can you get up to ten percent in that company without them firing you? Heard <laughs> up? What like, you said? He was the CEO or something. Mm-hmm. Like, he was high up. Listen, yeah, up. for real. Y'all real allies. If you're a real ally and you are in a hiring capacity, wherever you are, you should immediately try to get. Where you work up to seven percent black immediately, even if it gets you fired. Right, right. I mean, right. that's mm. half our All population. We built money the talks. Money talk bullshit. Walk a thousand miles, man. That's all I got. Right yes, sir. Like even yes, with sir. my friend, he, she was like, so her husband works. You know, her husband is an executive. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, he always focus, has focused on hi- making sure he hires women. She had to focus, get him to focus on hiring black as well. Mm-hmm. So if, but it just happens that he has a white woman wife who forces him as a white man to think about black people. And, and it's not that he doesn't like us. We just weren't, it wasn't a, an automatic thought. But because of his wife, now we're in the conversation. And now we're a consideration. You understand what I'm saying? Like, that Mm -hmm. matters. Like, because of her, Black people have gotten work. Real work. Like, with money. Real money. You understand what I'm saying? Like, that matters. That matters, man. Yeah. Like, think about it. Like, if you get five, if you get five or six Black people, uh, Eighty, seventy, eighty thousand dollar a year. Each person does that in a, each company. Like you have elevated the black community. It's not reparations, motherfucker, and it's not affirmative action, but it's some love. It's a start. We can buy the hood now. Oh you, no! You I can't buy back the hood. Buy <laughs> back the hood. Buy back the block. <laughs> if you are one of those people saying, "But damn, I can never find qualified black people to hire." It sounds like you need to create a pipeline. Yep. If you can't find black people that are qualified, you need to go and find some black people that you think are smart enough to train and teach and train and teach them, and then they'll be qualified. And then you can hire them. Uh, or and find then you can pass find, yourself on the be in the shit. Or find a local community college in a black community and say, hey, I need this is what a I need. Mm-hmm. Yep, this is what I need, community college. This is what my company needs. And I, I want black people to fill these positions. I hate to tell you this. I need companies to get their shit together and go back to fucking training people to do fucking work. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of shit, a lot of shit that they make you that you make people go to college for, when you get on the job training, you really could have just trained me to do this shit. I didn't need to spend the last two to three years working on it. You could have just trained me to do this shit. <laughs> it's not that fucking. But we got. But we got. Well, we got to look at the history of people wanting degrees for jobs, right? But it's because it, it's that started in the sixties and seventies, mm-hmm. right? Because they were trying to keep us out. <laughs> that's what. That's and, what all and, these and all these uh, degrees the and stuff was all about. Mm-hmm. It was giving white folks a giving white folks another leg up for these positions. Well, so and so went to college. Most of us, they know most of us Negroes weren't going to college. We couldn't afford to go to college. Not that we didn't want to. Not that we weren't capable. Money just wasn't there. But I just wanted to put that out there. And now Asians are beating the brakes off of them at every level, and they don't know what to do. Well, now actually, they they they're starting to see it, but they're like, it ain't. But it ain't hit them yet. And I'm not mad at it. But why are y'all worried about the Negroes? And I think. I think that the companies they should come to the high schools in the ghetto, like fuck community college. Like we ain't even going to community college. I'm yeah, let's do a real pipeline. Create go to a private go to a school and be like, we're gonna give you What's money your point, John? for yeah. a program in high yeah. school. I love that, John. All righty then. 
We got anything else, y'all? No. <laughs> He's so funny. All right, let's wrap this up. We did a good yeah, job. Everybody's it's, everybody's it's gonna be smarter time. now because they watched our show. Yeah, you have That's to how we get down. Outro. Thank you, everybody, for coming to listen to us rant on Reset Race, uh, where we where we discuss race and politics and all this other good stuff. Uh, please follow us on on uh, I mean, subscribe to us on on YouTube and wherever else you find us. Thank you so much for stopping by. We'll talk to you soon. Deuces. Listening to Reset Race. You now tuned in to Reset Race. Uh, uh. You're listening to Reset Race. You now tuned in to Reset Race. What? Put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Back on the grill again. We grilling them. Uh. You're listening to Reset Race. Adults need reparations to make America make great. America uh, great. You're tuned in to Reset Race. We no longer starving while others eat off our plate. No. You're listening to Reset Race. We focused on our justice claim. We know what is at stake. Uh, you're tuned in to Reset Race. You'll find out who really about justice and really who fake. On the edge, go back to U.S. Southern plantations. Pennies, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration. Redlining lynchings, we are old from this nation. You're not about justice if you ain't for reparations. MG, the wise one, cousin mother intellectual. Samantha bringing fire, anti-black, we pressing you. No permanent friends and no permanent enemies. The backbone of the country, the way you need our energy. You gon' see, listening to Reset Race. You now tuned in the reset race. Uh, uh. You're listening to reset race. You now tuned in the reset race. Uh, put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Back on the grill again. We grilling them. Uh. You're listening to Reset Race. Adults need reparations to make America make great. America uh, great. You're tuned in to Reset Race. We no longer starving while others eat off our plate. No. You're listening to Reset Race. We focused on our justice claim. We know what is at stake. Uh, you're tuned in to Reset Race. You'll find out who really about justice and really who fake. Uh, uh, uh. Until you do right by me, everything you think about is going to crumble. Floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, Today, many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. Now, this is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check.